Hello everybody, I'm Hujiwana and this is Space Dock. Today we are taking a look at spacecraft evolution, the way designs have changed and grown through generational iteration, which only really happens in the big, long-running franchises. The first of these is Star Wars, which not only covers nearly half a century in real life, but even more than that in-universe. Despite technology in the setting being largely stagnant, there's still plenty of new designs building upon old ones, with the most obvious being the big grey triangles of Doom. These start out life as large transports and landing vessels, followed up by carriers and progressing into the battleship style we all know and love. There's also many offshoots, both smaller and more specialised, and much larger and more menacing. But beyond the main route of Acclimator, Venator, Imperial, Resurgent, these ships are more of a template rather than evolution. The other half-century-old franchise with Star in its name has done ship evolution far more, especially with the Federation vessels. I mean, there's what, seven or eight Enterprise designs now? And more if you include refits in that. There's even three Voyagers these days. In a similar way to Star Wars, Star Trek's ship evolution was largely constrained to the visual side of things. There were updates to warp speed as time went on, but that didn't really do all that much, and anything else is pretty much just techno babble. The ships still fly about in the same way, do the same things, fire the same weapons. There are some exceptions to this, but I'll go over those in a minute. Each ship update was more about the aesthetics, beginning with bringing up the original Enterprise to movie standards a decade after the TV show ended. The refit ship was the same general layout, but just better looking, and it was put up against a ship with a similar style, but different layout. The generations that followed experimented with changing proportions, styling, and merging parts together, but they're all still recognisably Federation, even through large changes like the jump to the Galaxy class. Things got fairly non-linear at that point, thanks to the crossover between the later TOS movies and TNG, and the lost era between those two time periods, leading to the creation of the Ambassador class to fill in the space. This non-linear ship design progression behind the scenes was eventually followed up by the NX-01, which had a lot of design inspiration from the fan favourite Akira class. While on the subject of the Akira class, I want to mention that all the various eras and styles across the show has led to a lot of fan and non-canon designs that transplant one ship into the stylings of another era, and one of the best renditions of this I can think of is Diogo Vincenzi's Kusanagi class. This thing is just gorgeous, taking one of the best and most popular non-Enterprise Federation designs and putting it in that glorious motion picture style. And remixing old designs with new styling has now, thanks to Picard Seasons 2 and 3 using Star Trek Online designs, become a canon concept. This sets up the post-Dominion War Federation, now lacking a major ship construction site with the burning of Mars, as one that looks back for ideas, and doing extensive refits on old, mothballed designs. That show also canonised the NX-01 refit with the secondary hull, as well as, of course, the Enterprise F, yet another STO design that was made many years ago that has gotten a recognition recognition it really deserves. Now, back to the idea that the technology hasn't improved, because there are exceptions, the first being that NX-01. The older tech here meant it had limitations compared to the many ships that followed it. Dramatically going in the other direction all the way to the 32nd century, there's the big changes that got applied to the USS Discovery during its refit. The big one that actually meant anything is the installation of a cloaking device, which we don't see many other Federation ships of this era using, but they do have them. There's also the personal transporters, but those are more of a fleet-wide upgrade, and the floaty disconnected ship parts, which admittedly are more of an aesthetic thing. So, the evolution of the Star Trek ships is largely based on appearances, with each new generation, each new TV show or movie run wanting to set itself apart from the others. There's designs made from one era, inspiring those in another, set many years before, and ships designed years ago being repurposed or canonised, or being designed to fill in these gaps in the fossil record, or even having different appearances and styles across different shows. It's all very messy and very interesting because of that. So, that's the two big franchises, what about the smaller ones? Let's start with the other Star Something setting, Stargate, which while fairly long running, didn't really do generational leaps. There was the occasional different ship, but by and large, everyone just used the same thing throughout their entire lifetime. There was the jump from Prometheus to Daedalus, and the Asgard change to the O'Neill class, but generally speaking, the evolution that did occur was in continuous technological updates, which is what Stargate did best. 
For example, the Prometheus started out with a highly experimental hyperdrive based on the very unstable Naquadria, which went… well. It took a full refit by the Asgard to bring it up to an actual workable standard, and by the time it could actually fly anywhere beyond the solar system, the Daedalus class was entering production, and that underwent its own series of upgrades, especially on the Odyssey which essentially replaced the Prometheus as SG-1's usual ride. That thing ended up with a repository of Asgard knowledge, Asgard beam weapons, a cloaking device, and a ZPM to power it all. So that's another route to go with spacecraft evolution, where new tech gets applied to existing ships as it becomes available. To be fair, this only worked as well as it did in Stargate because the entire show was basically about that. About humanity finding technology, making allies, helping people out throughout the many years the SGC was active. We got to see where the tech came from, the change from the Tauri using jury-rigged captured ships to building their very own, and the struggles they faced along the way. To round this video out, we go to another franchise with star in its name, Battlestar Galactica, which, while not showing all that much evolution in its titular vessels, does show it for the smaller craft, the Vipers. However, these are only really cosmetic upgrades, with only the Mark III from Blood and Chrome having any tangible differences thanks to its integrated missile launches. Not even the Mark VII is all that different, though to be fair its computers pretty much got neutered, so there's actually a decent lore reason for it not being that much better than a Mark II. What I find more interesting are the Cylon base stars, especially taking into account Deadlock, which I'm sure many of you picked up when it was free a few weeks ago. The main show includes three steps of the base star evolution process. The beginning with the enormous double sourced original, the end with the orbital bombardment spiky thing, and a transitory step in the middle in the form of the Guardian base star. There is also one more in Blood and Chrome that sits somewhere between the Guardian and the original. These main three are great, and that middle design of the Guardian base star by itself is a brilliant missing link between the wildly different designs of the base stars from each of the two Cylon Wars. What the team behind Deadlock did was extrapolate further from that and add some more steps between the very lanky Guardian and its forebear, and even modified the original to have the same Y-shaped motif on it. The first step isn't really a base star, but bears a lot of the same elements. It's the Cerberus supercarrier, which is more like a single stack version of the design. It has one saucer and the familiar Y shape, with the second inverted Y being supporting elements and an engine module, making the Cerberus the only base star-like vessel to have visible engines. The next step in Deadlock is the Argos, which has an upper saucer the same size as that on the Cerberus, but with much longer arms on it, and a much smaller lower saucer with backwards arms, forming the familiar star shape that all following base stars used. This is also the first base star to have no guns on it, relying entirely on its raiders and endless streams of missiles to beat its opponents into submission from a distance. The last base star is by far the most interesting one, as it represents an entirely different design philosophy to its kin, both in appearance and armament. Rather than being a long-range carrier like the other base stars, the Kratos is much more like a battle star, with thick armour and a lot of heavy artillery, with rapid-fire missiles and some raiders to back it up. It's a big what-if on the route that the Cylons could have continued on going down, rather than what actually happened. So that is some of the ways that spacecraft design lineages have been depicted through sci-fi, which generally seems to be more along the lines of updating visuals and then filling in gaps retroactively. It's less common that there's any real evolution going on. There's not many times that ships have been changed out or built to respond to changing external pressures and emerging technologies. Does it matter though? Not really, because the way Star Trek does it fits Star Trek. The way Stargate does it fits Stargate. Whatever route you end up taking in your own creations, if you even include multiple generations of craft, then having their evolution fit in with the rest of the setting is more important, but ultimately it's still up to you. You can support Space Dock by joining our Patreon where you can get our Space Fighter design reference book. Alternatively, you can support us directly through YouTube by giving us super thanks or by becoming a channel member. Thanks to our supporters, and thank you for watching.